All right, let's open up in prayer and then we will uh, jump into our person studies of the, of the apostles. God, as we seek to understand you better, we also seek to understand the people within scripture better, knowing who they are, what they did, um, how they acted and interacted with you. Truly amazing and gives us both uh, understanding of, of your will and your plan, as well as uh, understanding who we are, because they're just men and we're just people. And we can also spread your word according to what you want us to do. We thank you for that opportunity. Help us to learn, to grow, to understand so that we may be able to explain further and better to those who need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So we're in the Gospel of Matthew. We're dealing with the apostles. Uh, I don't think this is an actual picture. I'm pretty sure that's Peter. Well, what the heck's going on here? <laughs> we are in part two of uh, basically um, Jesus prepares and commissions the 12 apostles. And we're going to be dealing with a uh, Andrew, James, and John. I'll see if I can get to John or not. I have enough information to do so, but, you know, just I'm going to go through it and however long it takes. Um, we need to remember that in Matthew 9, 36 through 10, 4, Jesus declares to his disciples that it's time to increase the shepherds because the people were distressed and dispirited from the Pharisees and scribes who were not shepherding the people in accordance with the truth of the law. But fortunately, Jesus had been training shepherds as their replacement. The apostles and other disciples are called to be gentle, merciful, peacemakers. They are salt and light. They are being trained by Jesus, not only in the message of the kingdom, but later on will also receive power to do the same actions as Jesus to, to validate the message of the kingdom of heaven. Last lesson, we discussed Peter, so, or Cephas, or Simon, son of John, Simon's his Hebrew name. Cephas is the name that um, is, was given to him by Jesus Christ, which is translated into Peter or a small rock. Uh, we mark that Peter is the leader of the apostles and is instrumental um, as the leader of the apostles in the first part of the apostolic age. Remember in Acts, you have two main people who are on focus. First one's Peter and the second one would be Paul. Now we get into the other apostles. Some of them we'll know well. Some of them you may not know so well. It's always important to understand who we're dealing with when we deal with the, the names. Um, we don't want to have you all kind of just unfamiliar with the apostles. When you see someone's name, you should have an idea at least of who they were dealing with. So Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave him authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. So we're going to be dealing with Andrew, first and foremost. His name is actually Andreas. Andreas is in the Greek. It comes from the, the Greek word aner, which basically translates to be man. Now, the Hebrew name would probably either be Adam or Ish. We don't know because we don't, because Adam or Adam in Hebrew is typically just transliterated into Greek. However, the fact that his name comes from the word man and Adam in Hebrew means man, as well as Ish. Ish also is kind of a derivative of man. So there's two different words basically there for it. Um, and basically, a Andrew's name would be manly. Um, now, whether or not that is characteristic of who he is, we don't, we don't really know. Um, I like what, um, what has been uh, observed about Andrew, is that he is the silent, important apostle. We don't really know a lot about him. I mean, he doesn't really seem to have big roles within the Gospels, and we never hear about him after Acts chapter 1, basically in list form. He's referenced twice in Matthew. He's referenced four times in Mark, once in Luke, and five times in John. And in Acts, again, he's only mentioned one time, and that's in list form. 
Um, he is, he, there are two verses, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and Mark 1, 16, that are identical in content, which leaves us only about a handful of verses to really take into understanding who Andrew is and what he did. First and foremost, Andrew was a fisherman. He, that was his by trade um, and took on this family business. Um, now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. He lived with his family in Bethsaida. You lost me. I saw it. I'm green. Am I back? Excuse me while we're having technical. It's back. Wow. I don't think Satan wants us to learn about Andrew. <laughs> All right. And he lived with his family in Bethsaida. In John chapter 1, verse 44, and I'm going to be going through a lot of verses. And instead of having you turn to every one of them, which means we'll get through Andrew only, just look up here, write them down if you will, or just pay attention. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So here we have people who are very familiar with one another. As we go through the text, you're going to see a lot of connections. In fact, I'm looking and trying to get a flow chart together, kind of seeing who is who and where is where is everybody. But also in Mark 1, 29, we see that, um, that Andrew also uh, lived with his family. They came out of the synagogue. They came to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And it's interesting because of Simon's house, um, but it's Andrew's house as well, and they were with James and John, and that's where Simon's mother-in-law was. So what's this, the relationship between Simon's mother-in-law and Andrew? Nothing. Just let you know. <laughs> I always ask the question, I'm going, well, how does this influence Andrew? Well, it's Simon's mother-in-law, which means Andrew's like, I know her. Not really a relationship. Andrew was known as the first. Not the first apostle, not the premier apostle, but the first one called why is that? Well, because Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptizer. Um, we're going to go from John 1. So if you want to turn to John 1, we're going to be going like backwards and forwards through John 1 a little bit. Uh, it'll be on the screen as well. But you start in John 1, 40, and it says, One of the two who heard John speak and followed him, that is Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So we have this interaction here where Andrew was already kind of on the cusp of understanding that there's the Messiah was coming because he is being discipled by John the baptizer. Andrew was one of the first to recognize Jesus as the Lamb of God. In John chapter 1, verses 35 through 40, it says again, the next day John was standing with the two of the disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, Who do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where, you, where, you, where are you staying? And he said to him, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Very interesting. When you say that one of the two heard him and followed him, um, it's presumed because John does not speak of himself that the other one was John. I don't know if that's true or not. It's completely conjecture. Andrew then introduces Peter to Jesus. So after Andrew spends some time with Jesus, he comes and finds his brother. He found his own brother, Simon, which said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Furthermore, although it does not say, it does appear that though he found that, um, that the next day Jesus found Philip, and he was from Bethsaida, city of Andrew and Peter. Now, when you go through the text, Philip and Andrew are like best buds. They're always mentioned together. They're always talking with one another. And so it appears as though Philip probably knew Jesus through Andrew as well. So once again, you have Andrew as being this individual of being known as the person who introduces Jesus to people. You're going to see this later on as well. Andrew was just outside the main three. If you notice in Matthew chapter 10, it's Simon, then Andrew, then James, then John. And now the, the three 
that are mentioned there with besides Andrew are within that top three circle. But Andrew is always right there. It's kind of like he wants, he's either wants to be part of the three or he's just too shy or he's not as assertive um, or he just knows that's not his role. But in Mark chapter 13, verses three through four, we see that he is pretty close to that inner circle. It says he was in the, sitting at the Mount of Olives, that was Jesus Christ was, opposite the temple, and Peter and John and Andrew were questioning him. So Peter, James, and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. So four of them, the four were there questioning privately. Tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of the, of the coming. Now, that's very interesting because this here, Mark 13, uh, begins the the, um, the Mount Olivet Discourse, which you also read in Matthew chapter 25 and 26. Chapter 24 and 25. So you have Andrew right there listening to some of the most important teachings, especially about the end times. And he was one of the four individuals who heard it. Also in John chapter 12, Andrew is there. <clears throat> and this is where, we, again, we, we see him being the one who brings people to Jesus. There were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. Then the three came to fill. These men came to Philip, who was at the side of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, we want to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. So here we have this connection here where it appears as though perhaps Andrew is kind of like the one that is kind of like the door, the doorman of Jesus' inner group. Jesus then answered Andrew and Philip, saying, truly, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life, it, um, and sorry, he who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, that where I am, there my servant will be also. Words we know very well, but we don't realize oftentimes who he's speaking to. And it appears he's just speaking to Philip and Andrew. Furthermore, in, in John chapter 6, Andrew was the one who was there when Jesus fed the 5,000. Of course, all the disciples were, but this is the it's kind of the Andrew's kind of involvement with this is that he is the one who brought who? The young boy who had the loaves and the fish. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw there was signs he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing a large crowd that was coming to him, said to Philip, interesting, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he knew what he was about to do. Philip answered him, said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? So Jesus then had the people sit down. There was much grass in the place. Jesus then took the loaves and then given, given thanks. He distributed to those who were seated, likewise also the fish, as much as they wanted. So once again, we have Andrew right in the place to where he is introducing Peter. He introduces Greeks to Jesus, and he also introduces this young boy with five loaves and two fish. So many times, as I have already mentioned, Andrew and Philip are together. I always find that very interesting, how there's always seems to be pairs. And those pairs, I don't think, are accidental. In fact, if you go back into um, Matthew and, and, and Mark and Luke, you see that Jesus sends people out in pairs. Now, we can guess as to who it are, but the fact that Andrew and Philip are often mentioned together, it seems to indicate that they may have actually gone out together into various locations. Perhaps it was Peter and Andrew, but Philip and Andrew are always mentioned together. 
um, as far as being a partnership or how they talk to Jesus. In extra biblical his, uh, texts, uh, well, again, Andrew has a major, minor, port, minor, minor part in a major role, which again sounds almost contradictory, but you think about it, how big of, of Andrew's part was there with the apostles as you see it? But you don't get a lot of information. So we don't have a lot of information about Andrew, but he was obviously very instrumental with the apostles, especially during the time of Jesus. After Acts 1, where he's just mentioned in list form, they mentioned the 12 at a couple different times, but you don't ever have Andrew's name mentioned again, not in any of the epistles, not in Acts. So if you want to know what happens to Andrew, you have to go extra biblical. Now, when you deal with extra biblical information, we don't hold it in the highest regard. It's information, historical data. Um, is it true or not? Your guess is as good as mine. Some of it is a little bit more uh, verifiable as far as how, mu how much is written, especially by whom. Um, but whenever we start getting into extra biblical information, we have to understand that there was a particular group of people that controlled the narrative. And they controlled the narrative to their own devices. Who was that? It was the Catholics, uh, the fighting Irish. Yeah, I got my eye on you. <laughs> and so if the Catholics are controlling something and they're using it for their own devices, I'm going, I'm not exactly sure if it's very reliable. So. I take it with a grain of salt. However, most people do agree that Andrew did go to uh, Scythia. Scythia was basically modern day Ukraine and into Russia. There's tales of him going into Greece um, and that is where they think, I say the word think loosely, there's no real written documentation that time, but there's a lot of um, verbal lore, so to speak, that Andrew was crucified in Greece. He was crucified, given the option to say, he, but he requested, like Peter did, when Peter was crucified upside down, Andrew was that I don't want to be crucified like Christ, so put me on an X. And you see, whenever you see this crucifixion scene where there's an old man on an X, it's usually depicted of Andrew. Does anybody know what this led to? Now, again, is there any documentation for this? No, not really. Um, there's simply just lore and a lot of paintings depicting what was stated in lore. Now, you move to Scotland. King Angus of Scotland, if you ever watched Braveheart, there's Angus is there. When he said he was on, you know, under great stress and under lots of threat, says he saw an X-shaped cross appear in the sky. And he believed it was a sign of St. Andrew's protection. To which I say, <laughs> in other words, I don't know where they get this stuff from, right? However, they were victorious. And from that moment, they have adopted St. Andrew's cross as their symbol. So when you see the flag, it is depicted because that was St. Andrew's cross. Now, why Scotland? Who knows? You know, you think it may be Greece, but no. So here we have an individual who was instrumental early on, obviously did things. I don't think that, I don't think anyone doubts that the apostles did go out. Um, the fact, there's a lot of different um, attestations within um, Ukraine and in Russia about Andrew. And a lot of people think he's the patron saint of Ukraine, oh, which, again, in the news today is very interesting. Um, but whether or not he actually went there, we don't know for certain, although I, since there's no real competing data, I'm going to go ahead and go with it, saying, yeah, okay, that makes sense because of the where other people went. It does appear that that Andrew did, in fact, go to Ukraine. Whether or not he made it to Greece, whether or not he was crucified, again, I don't know for certain. That brings us to the next person. 
James, the son of Zebedee. <laughs> Talk about your characters in the Bible, right? Um, James and John have probably the second amount of most information in dealing with who they are, what they did, their statements. Um, and James, I find almost e extremely interesting. And we know basically from his origins of with Jesus to the end. So James, the son of Zebedee. Now there's another, there's a reason why we call him Saint uh, James, the son of Zebedee is because there's another James in the group, the son of Alphaeus. So one James and another James. The word uh, for both names are the same. It's basically in Greek, it is ekobos, ekobos, ekobos uh, which basically is translated from Jacob. Now, Jacob is heel grabber or usurper, which is an attestation, or they're obviously named after Jacob, the son of Isaac. Often happens, you know, they're, they pick somebody who is within their family tree or somebody they want to honor. And so James was a very popular name, or if you want to be more specific, Jacob was a more po was a very popular name in Israel during the time of Jesus Christ. Again, he was one of the first four disciples and was in that inner circle. Remember how Andrew was just outside of it, James was inside of it. And whenever Jesus took three only, or he wanted to say something very special, he always took Peter, James, and John. James, this James, son of Zebedee, is not the author of the book of James. We know that for certain. He's often referred to as James the Greater, because James, later on, there's the other James, the son of Alphaeus, because, is known as James the Lesser. Now, nowhere in Scripture will you find the name James the Greater, but you do find the other person named James the Less, or James the, and if you look at the names, it doesn't mean he's less of a personality. It's probably size. We probably have big James and small James. And, and uh, as, as we do in English, we give people nicknames if they have the same name. So they named him um, James, the son of Zebedee, and you'll notice that he is uh, referred to as a different moniker. Or James the Lesser is probably a little smaller dude, and so he gets the nickname the Less, which I don't know if I would appreciate. Again, he has more reference than Andrew, but still less than Peter or his brother John. John has more. Um, he left his father's business, which I titled, I, I had, if I'm going to say he left his father's business, this, the business has to have a name. So I call it Zebedee and Sons Fishing Company. And he's like, okay, so they just decided to pack up and leave. In Mark chapter 1, verse 20, um, this is stated kind of clearly where he sees, Jesus sees um, John and James. And he calls them, and then he left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. Which is interesting because, you know, they left him, but they didn't left him destitute. They, he had servants, and obviously Zebedee probably was a little wealthy. Because who happens to follow Jesus along with James and John? Anybody know? It's, it's mama. Which tells you if you have... Jesus, James and John following Jesus, and the mom says, I'm going to, what does that tell you about James and John? They're, they're probably young. Probably. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, if, you know, I'm 30 years old, and, and I'm going to go ahead and go off to a new job, I don't think mom's going to follow me. However, if you're 17, 16, 15 years old, working with your parents, and they said, follow me, uh, you, you may have a, a protective mother. In fact, the mother ends up asking Jesus for a particular favor later on, which upsets all the other disciples. He was probably older than John, being named first. Okay, so when you have, you know, in, in Matthew chapter 10, it always it says um, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. So you have um, always mentioned within that kind of context, James is already always mentioned first, and John, his brother. John goes on to be more prominent later on in the Acts, but James in the Gospels always seems to be mentioned first. And so we think that they, he is a little bit older than John. <clears throat> James, with his brother John, are partners with Peter. 
So James and John, Peter and Andrew, the four, Andrew kind of, I don't, for some reason, is not part of the inner circle with the three, but they're partners. So James and John, sons of Zebedee, were partners with Simon, and they fished together. So this is how Jesus finds his first uh, followers, were that they were all knowing each other. And it's interesting because there's also a, a, a possible assumption they might have been related. <clears throat> now, along with Brother John, James was giving the moniker. I always miss it. I always, I don't, I never say this name right. Um, but they were given the name um, Sons of Thunder. I'll, you know what? I'm not going to deal with the overall uh, statement of the name, but they were given the name Sons of Thunder. Um, the explanation for that nickname seems to come from Luke 9, 51 through 56. We don't know if this is why they were given the nickname Sons of Thunder, uh, but it seems to be kind of fit pretty well. So in Luke 9, 51, when the days were approaching for his ascension, that is to go up to Jerusalem, he sent messengers ahead of him. <clears throat> and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. Remember, the Samaritans and, and the Jews didn't like each other. So when they didn't receive Jesus, they went there and said, no, we're not going to have him. When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Sounds reasonable. But turning to them... Jesus rebuked James and John. You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. So they're basically having this presumption there were, were prophets along with Jesus. Again, this is after they've already given some power. So they're not like presuming anything. They've already demonstrated certain powers. And when Elijah was confronted and, and dismissed, what did Elijah do? He called down fire from heaven and burned him alive. But that was not the point of Jesus Christ. He's not coming in the form of the prophet as, a, as an aggressor or somebody who is demanding attention, someone who is um, uh, basically coming in the judgment of God. Rather, he is coming to save. James and John were not aware of that fully. And so when they saw this insult to Jesus, they're like, Fine, we'll let God deal with you. Now, whether or not this is exactly why they're called the Sons of Thunder, um, it does give us an idea of possibly why they are called that. James seems to be very presumptuous in Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 40. Um, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons. Now, James and John are in the same context here. And we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. But Jesus said to him, do not hinder him. So, hey, you're casting out demons in the name of Jesus Christ. You're not one of us. Stop it. So we hindered him. And Jesus goes, don't do that. If they're not against me, they're for me. In Mark chapter 10, this is where it gets interesting. Now, if you go to Matthew in the same context, it's, it's John and James's brother, or sorry, James and John's mother, who actually comes and asks them this, but probably at the behest of James and John. So it's there kind of like, hey, mom, go ask Jesus for this. Again, kind of that idea that they are probably very young. So James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. Now, if somebody comes up and asks me that question, makes that kind of demand, I go, we'll see. <laughs> it's probably more standard than what we think of in English. And Jesus says, what do you want? They said to him, grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory. When you come into your kingdom and you're ruling the world, we want to be your right hand, your left hand. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that we are, I'm able to, that I'm drinking? Or to be baptized, the baptism which I am baptized? They said to him, we are. It's kind of presumptuous. Do we know anybody else that was kind of that kind of presumptuous? Peter. 
Jesus, I'll die with you. He was like, he's like, no, you're not. You're going to deny me. But they, they ask him and he says, are you able? They, we are able. He says, the cup that I drink, you shall drink. In other words, you're going to go through the sufferings I'm going to go through. And you shall be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. However, to sit on my right and my left is not mine to give. So they asked for something. He said, oh, are you going to go ahead and be deal with the same problems, same, same um, uh, oppression, same persecution I'm going to go through? And they said, we're able. He goes, you're going to have that, but I'm not the one who's able to give what you're asking for. It's kind of like, you be careful what you ask for. You might get it, but you may not have the results you're looking for. That's always one of the lessons you have. James was one of the three, James, Peter, and John, who was with Jesus Christ at the Mount of Transfiguration. Six days later, that's a different situation, Jesus took, uh, took, him, took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. It's just them four. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. And his garments became <clears throat> as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Now, notice that James and John, they're presumptuous as well. They're not recorded as saying something. If you wish, we'll build three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a, a, a behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, what disciples? James, Peter, and John. They fell on their face to the ground, were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. Lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell this vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And then they go on and ask for their questions. James often asked questions along with Peter, along with John, along with Andrew, that led to many important teachings. In Matthew chapter 17, I don't know why I don't have that one. Wait, sorry, Mark chapter 5. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, they came to the house of synagogue. Um, oh, wait, I skipped, a, I skipped one. Da, 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 da. They were, he, that James was one of the three who saw Jesus raise the little girl that we learned about in Matthew from the dead. Actually, I think we did in Mark. No, it doesn't Mark yet. It's Mark 5. We haven't gone here yet. That's next. So James was with Peter and John and the synagogue's official, when they came to see when, when the little girl had died. Jesus, this is where Jesus walks in and says she's not dead, she's only sleeping. And so we have this, again, a unique situation witnessed by James, Peter, and John. Now we get to the part where James asks questions. So James, Matthew chapter 17, verses 10 through 13, we have James, Peter, and John getting details that are not often uh, given to other people. And his disciples asked him, um, now the, if you look back in Matthew 17, this is from the Mount, uh, off of the Mount of Transfiguration. And so these disciples, Peter, James, and John, asked Jesus Christ about him being transfigured. He says, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has already came. And when they and they did not recognize him, but do to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the baptizer. Andrew was there, obviously. I'm sorry, I'm sorry not Andrew. Peter was there, obviously. But James was there hearing these words as well. And they understood, they came to terms with, what Jesus was talking about. Furthermore, in Matthew chapter 20, after Jesus had told them that they would suffer with him, but they are not going to be able to be necessarily granted the one on the right, one on the left, 
the ten heard it. The ten heard that James is in, and and um, John's request, and they became upset with them. But Jesus called them to himself and said, "You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you will be your servant." And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And so the questions of James and John, the presumption of James and John, turn into valuable understanding of the kingdom. In Mark 13, 3, As he was sitting on Mount Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately, and that led to the Olivet Discourse, teaching about the end times. That's not all. When Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he takes his disciples with him, and then he leaves his disciples and takes the three with him. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, then Jesus came to them in a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And then he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond and fell on his face and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will but you. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. What's the disciples? Peter, James, and John. And then he said to Peter, who was the leader of the, of the twelve, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter temptation. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. So here we have again an individual like Peter, presumptuous in nature, very demanding at times, not exactly being the um, most attentive, good James, bad James, but always in that inner circle. He didn't have a long career. And now, when you say long career, uh, we talk about like Peter, James, uh, talk about Peter and John and various other individuals who seem to have a lengthier career, talk about 30, 40 years. For the first 15 years of the church, James was obviously very instrumental. But in Acts chapter 12, we have the death of James. It's the only one in the, of the apostles in Acts that we have a record of the death. Now, this is not the first martyr. That would be Stephen, who was stoned. In Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, now about that time, King Herod laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them, and he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And so you have James gone. Acts 12. This is very early as far as the overall foundation of the church. It always kind of um, leaves me kind of like wondering, you know, what happened here? Why, why would God allow one of the 12 to be put to death with the sword so early on in the ministry? Now, it had been 15 years. You're probably looking at around 40 A.D., which is why we know that he is not the author of the book of James because that was probably written around that 45 A.D. time frame. But I always find James to be very interesting because you have an individual, young, presumptuous, yet God is sitting there using him and even allowing him to suffer with him because we look at this and go, that's sad, and that's distressful. Rather, according to Jesus and according to the Bible, dying on behalf of righteousness allows that person to have the greatest amount of glory from God. But unlike his brother James, John lives a very, very long time. James is put to death around 40 A.D., John lives probably close to 95 AD. I have 18 minutes, so we'll get through this. And how, and, and how will I do that? Well, because we've already gone over him, except for a few things. John 
is the Greek word Ionis. Um, it is um, basically a Hebrew Hilhan, and it means Jehovah or Yahweh is gracious, depending on your translation. Um, we do see a few other Johns in Scripture. In fact, when you get later on to Acts, there is another John, but John called Mark. Mark, the nephew of Peter, who writes the book of Mark. So it's not the same John. So be careful when you get into the later on to Acts because John falls off the scene relatively early in the book of Acts as well. In the Gospels, John <clears throat> is often mentioned with James. And so if you want to see the life of James in the Gospels, I'm sorry, the life of John in the Gospels, see the life of James. We just went over it. Almost everything that James is attested to doing, John was with him. Where he went, where they, what they said, they said it together. They went and they worked as a group. Um, whether or not they went off in pairs, like we assume Philip and Andrew did, we don't know. But James and John were always seemed to be right there next to each other. John, however, wrote down information. What do we have from John? We have the Gospel of John. We have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the Book of Revelation, all from this apostle. Interestingly enough, I'm not sure if you realize this or not. When we went through the life of James, did we go to the book of John? Did you, did you, did you notice? We didn't, not once. James is not referred to one time in the book of John. Is that because he just didn't want to have nepotism? I'm not sure. Obviously, Mark writes a lot about Peter, right? And John himself doesn't even refer to himself as John in the book of John. What does John call himself in his own uh, account of Jesus Christ? Remember? Yeah. The, the beloved disciple. The one who Jesus loved. Now, I don't think that's, he loved me more than everyone else. It's basically saying, I'm the beloved one. I'm the loved one. And this is used throughout the, the entire gospel of, of John. I think referred to at least four or five times and other times in which the writer of this particular writing he kind of talks to himself about that in the third person. If you go through the text, you find that Jesus, uh, that John is the one who leans on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. Now, again, I don't, I, I don't know what this really refers to, right? There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Um, this is probably very odd in our culture, right? Uh, I don't think this is typical. Um, but remember, this is coming on the heels of great distress. And exactly what's happening here. Now, I, I don't know. And it's, it'd be wrong for us to presume anything except for the fact that Jesus and John were very close. And we know that because he was one of the inner circle. Interestingly enough, I think this also attests to the fact that John was very young. It's like a kid. So Jesus taking him like a, like a son. And we know that to be true as well. Why? Why do we take John as being like close, so close to Jesus? Because he was the one who was at the foot of the cross. He's also the one who was put in charge of his mother Mary. So when he was reclining on Jesus' bosom, his disciples whom Jesus loved, Simon Peter gestures says, who is it that you're speaking of? Now this is when Jesus says, there's going to be someone who's going to betray me. And Peter's like, hey, who is it? And Jesus go, and John goes, yeah, Jesus, tell us. So John kind of reiterates what Peter tells him and basically finds out that it's Judas. In John 19, this is where we find out he is entrusted with the care of Jesus' mother. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. When the Jesus is uh, resurrected, interestingly enough, again, this is, this is probably one of the strangest things, I think, is that the two disciples run 
to find out whether or not Jesus was actually not in the tomb. And that was Peter and John. I don't know where James is. I don't know where Andrew is. Why Peter and John only? Not sure. And they ran together. And then John, obviously younger and faster than Peter, got to the tomb first. And then, but John is less presumptuous than Peter because John stops at the face of the tomb, stoops down and looks in. Peter bursts in and just goes right into the tomb. It is John who attests to the fact that he was able to um, see that the fact that the linen wrappings were rolled in place by itself, and their disciple who had first come to the tomb also entered in after Peter does and saw, and look what it says, he believed. One, the first one to actually see the evidence of the resurrection, and he goes, yes, he's alive. The other ones go off doubting. John sees the linen clothing. He's not in the tomb and believed that he was actually risen from the dead. Later on in John 21, Jesus standing on the shore, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. was able to recognize him from the boat when they went to go fishing. But that's not where it ends with John. A lot of time to get to the apostles and get to Acts. And, the, and we know that Peter and Paul are often emphasized. Paul is not one of the original 12. But John is, is there and present, but strangely in the background. John is obviously very pronounced within the Gospels. When you get to Acts, do you know what he's doing? What, what is John doing in the book of Acts? He's basically holding Peter's hand following him wherever he goes. Acts 3, 1, you have Peter and John going up to the temple. And they saw a man lame and they healed him. It says they healed him, not Peter. In Acts 3, 11, the man whom they healed was clinging to Peter and John. They're all full of amazement. Then Peter replied to the people. So John is there with Peter Kind of being, I, I guess, his second. Peter's the prominent one. John is always right there with Peter, always mentioned. Acts 4.13. They observed the confidence that Peter and John had. And they recognized that Peter and John was being with Jesus. After they warned him not to um, speak anymore in the name of Jesus Christ, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And then Acts chapter 8 is the last time we hear about the person of John in the book of Acts. Except for Acts 12 where it says James, the, son of, uh, the, the brother of, of John, gets killed. But we don't actually read anything about John there. In Acts chapter 8 verse 14, the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. They sent them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they may receive the Holy Spirit, for they had not received the Holy Spirit. And it was James and John who were there, basically in charge, giving the people who had believed in Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit. Again, transition time, don't try this at home. And they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. But we do also have Paul speaking of John. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 9-10, through 10, this is after James... The brother of John dies, and this is talking about James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, and, recogni and recognizing the grace that had been given to me, that me is Paul, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars. John was seen as, with Peter and James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, the, the pastor at in Jerusalem, were there as the ones who had the, 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 the main three so I find this kind of interesting because in the Gospels you have Peter, James, and John. Later on, another James takes over for that James. Very interesting. John is also the author of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as Revelation. Now John becomes the elder. He's referred to himself as the elder in, the, in, in his letters. And he, why? Because he outlives all the other apostles. He's the oldest one, basically. I believe he starts out as the youngest one, and he ends up being the oldest one. 
he outlives all the other apostles. And the book of Revelation is the last of the apostolic writings. So you have John being the youngest one, one of the first ones called, being in the inner circle, ends the writings of the New Testament. Now, according to extra biblical information, John becomes the elder at Ephesus. I'm not sure if you remember this or not, but I, I when I taught about John um, in, in, a, in a couple of our lessons when we go with authors over 2nd and 3rd John, I believe it was when I taught it. I, I don't know about that. Uh, that's again, seems to be um, not well attested extra biblical information. I looked at all the different resources. I'm going, I don't know if I trust this or not. The, the, the people who say it um, are not really as reliable as I want them to be for me to make sure that that is true. However, he is definitely a Patmos. So if you follow the extra biblical information about John, um, he eventually is imprisoned for preaching the gospel. And then he eventually ends up at Patmos. And he even writes from Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, that I, John, your brother, and fellow partaker of the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He was imprisoned and basically exiled to Patmos. Why is he in Patmos? Tradition says, nothing in scripture, nothing's really tested this, but it's interesting. Tradition says that the Romans tried to kill him and could not. They tried to boil him in oil and he came out unharmed. And they go, you know what? Let's just get rid of this guy. We, now, now, I don't know if that's true or not because I don't know about you. Everyone else was crucified or beheaded or just stabbed through. I don't know why you would try to boil someone in oil to try to kill him. Why not just cut his head off? And then you what, you get scared, and so you send them away. You think if you had that enough fear that you're going to go ahead and send them away, that you would just release them. But no, he gets exiled to Patmos. I, I don't know if the boiling in oil is true or not. I do know he ends up at Patmos, and he was a, pris a political prisoner there at Patmos. Later on, it's said that he was um, released to Ephesus. Don't know. But it does appear as though he is an apostle to that upper region where Andrew was in the north of the Black Sea. It appears as though John may have been um, the apostle to the people who were just below the Black Sea. That Turkey region, this is where Paul was going through the, Tur the area not known as Turkey and basically wanted to go north and was prevented from doing so. And I believe probably because John already had a ministry in that location, just as Peter did to Bithynia, which would have been more towards um, the, the east. John probably had that region, and Andrew also had individuals who were going in that north area. It is rumored that he died at the ripe old age of close to 90, um, sometime after 98 AD. So we have... John living a very, very long time. And if you're ever in that eastern portion or sorry, western portion of current day Turkey near Ephesus, there is a tomb that basically says this is the tomb of John the Apostle. Um, again, don't know if it's true or not. And I, I, this is kind of a dark. I see it's a lot better on my screen. I found this painting fascinating. It was obviously painted within the um, medieval times. Has John down here writing while on Patmos, and I don't know why there are ruins. You would think that during 98 AD, they'd be fresh buildings. Why are they ruins? I don't know. Anyway, um, so far we have studied Peter, James, Andrew, and John. I hope that that's been helpful, at least in the understanding of who they are. Now we're going to get into verse 3, where we get into people you don't know as well. Philip we know a little bit about. Bartholomew? Not a whole lot. Thomas? A little bit. What's he known for? Yeah, doubting. Doubting Thomas, right? We'll get into that, whether or not he was doubting Thomas or not. Uh, Matthew, the tax collector, we know. James, the son of Alphaeus? A little bit. Thaddeus? <laughs> Less. Simon, the zealot? 
even less. And then we'll get to Judas, um, which we have to say a lot about. We have to ask questions. So over the next couple of weeks, we'll go ahead and finish up with the apostles. For now, we'll close in prayer and we'll move on. And hopefully this has helped you understand who you're dealing with, with these four particular apostles. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word, helping us to be able to understand it through uh, an exposition, an understanding, searching out all these individuals and what they did um, and what they meant to you. It shows that you care and you love and they loved you. We thank you for their testimony and help us to learn from them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.